a god again, but with a golden calf. And if it had been a man, he had said, uh, five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband, they would assume, oh, he's talking just like all the prophets. Because they always talk about Israel being unfaithful to God as a husband. But because he's talking to a woman, we assume, oh, it can't be anything that important. And yet, I think she's tracking with him. Because she says, well, you say we should worship God in Jerusalem. She's not changing the subject. I think she's a lot smarter than we give her credit when I think the end of her group is exactly right. Well, thank um, you. Great. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I learned a lot. I was taking notes. So, uh, very helpful. And just the, the perspective you brought was so uh, rewarding. Anyway, so I do feel free to ask questions. I'm supposed to introduce myself. Most important things first, my lovely wife, Stacia, is here. And my two fine sons, my younger son is on the left. Uh, he's tall and has hair. He got it for me, and that's why I don't have it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just so you know who I am, I'm, uh, I'm conservative. I'm an evangelical. I'm actually what's called an inerrantist, which, among other things, means I, I believe the Bible, every bit of it is true. When Jesus walked on the water, he didn't walk next to the water. He walked on the water. Uh, I think that's probably more than physics. Uh, in the ancient world, spirits lived in the water. And if those of you who are working in the Middle East, when you show the bottom of your foot to something, you're showing uh, dominance. And so Jesus is putting the bottom of his foot on all those spirits. We just think he's doing cool physics stuff. But I think he's doing more than that. Uh, I'm a Baptist. I'm actually a lousy one. Um, but I am one. They, I don't know if they claim me as much as I claim milk. I'm actually a Calvinist, too. I'm just a lousy one. <laughs> and you'll actually see a little bit of that later. Uh, we were missionaries to Indonesia. I, I learned a ton of stuff. I was supposed to be there as a teacher. I learned a ton of stuff from there. And some of it went in that book. Uh, uh, it could have been called All the Things I Did Wrong in Indonesia, but it made a better title to call it uh, Misreading Scripture of uh, Western Time. I'm a pastor and teacher, and I'm currently blessed to serve right now as uh, provost at Columbia Atlantic University. I'm here really because of Bill's gracious invitation. It did arise from that book. I'm very humbled at how well that is done. I think it's in its 13th or 14th printing. I never know why a book does well when it does it. So, I could have written a book on uh, mystery. Well, actually, I could not have written a book on mystery and scripture with Eastern eyes. But somebody could have. Um, we all have that. I hope that some of you today will uh, hear something and say, oh, oh, well, that's why I do such and such. And some of you who are Eastern will say, oh, well, that's why they do such and such. <laughs> so, uh, it, it may be helpful. I, I don't know. We'll give it a try. Uh, I actually am a New Testament teacher that's uh, what I do, to, and I like studying the New, New Testament. And uh, I actually have this interest in intercultural hermeneutics. In one of my previous lives, I was director of the missions department. And uh, so, and uh, right now, I'm working on a book with uh, Rich, uh, tentatively called What Went Without Being Said. And we'll talk about cultural values in the uh, Middle East. Things that uh, the Bible always assumed everybody knows that. Well, Everybody did for a long time, but not, not so much anymore. Here's what I'm not doing. I'm not doing bashing the West. I get so tired of that when people want to make you feel guilty about being a Westerner. Or, let me go ahead and say, or being a white male. You know, I didn't pick that either. And, uh, and I, I hate people uh, making me feel guilty for doing that. Uh, I hope this is not a, a time to make you feel inadequate about uh, reading the Bible. My goodness, we read the Bible really well. Christians, I think, are doing a great job of reading and applying the Bible. But there's probably some ways that we can do it better, um, at least a little bit better here or there. But I think as Westerners, we do some things well. I think certain parts of the Bible we read really well because worldview is a lens that shapes how we view things. And so uh, it slants or twist the focus. It does mean certain things are really clear to us. I think Westerners do really well with topics like forgiveness and generosity. 
I remember talking to a Japanese friend of mine. He said, you Americans, the Christians are so amazing. You're not the least bit mad over uh, bombing Pearl Harbor. I said, no, it was a long time ago. I'm not mad about that at all. He said, that's wonderful. You just forgive? I said, yeah. He said, that's wonderful. Don't assume that's a two-way street. <laughs> so uh, I think we do certain things uh, really well, forgiveness and generosity, but there's other things we don't do quite as well as, say, an African or an Asian Christian would, and uh, they'll notice those parts um, uh, maybe better than uh, we do. So uh, does it really happen? Do we get a slant to Scripture uh, if we're really trying to believe it and apply it? take it seriously. I mean, if I study, can I get around uh, doing that? Uh, sure, but I think it happens some anyway. How does it happen? I think it happens because it happens without noticing. Uh, rarely does a fish notice water is the old phrase. Uh, oh, wait, when does a fish usually notice water? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, when you're on a mission trip, or uh, when Stella moved to San Francisco, suddenly, wow, uh, I'm not in Kansas anymore kind of thing. Uh, you, you know, when you, start, when you start working with a community that's not your own, when, you move, when I moved to Indonesia, wow, I started noticing the water that I had been uh, raised in. Uh, because it usually, uh, when we read a text, the most important things um, usually go without this. And that's true uh, everywhere. It's true in our own culture. Uh, let me illustrate it this way. In our culture, in the culture I grew up in, in my Texas culture, we're from Texas. Um, now, my wife will tell you that immediately. We're from Texas. Now, we haven't lived there in 35 years. But <laughs> the Texan that does not have okay, We're just on a short sojourn. From, so in my Texas culture, floors are dirty. Tables are clean. Chairs, countertops are clean. Um, so you don't stand on top of things that are clean. Okay, you don't wear your shoes on things that are clean. So one time when we were early in our marriage, the... The bulb blew out over the dining room table, and you know, my wife said, "You need to change the bulb." Okay. So I started to get up on the table. She said, "You can't wear your shoes on the table." Okay. So what did I do? I took my shoes off, like my old sweaty stocking feet. <laughs> but it doesn't really matter. It doesn't matter how clean the floors are or how dirty the table is. In my culture, floors are dirty. That's why we raise our tables up off the floor. That's why we raise our chairs up off the floor. We even raise our beds up off the floor. My Japanese friends are just like that. They have the same attitudes I do, with one difference. For them, floors are not dirty. So do they wear their shoes in the house? Where do they sit? Where do they eat? Where do they sleep? Just like me. Mm -hmm. I only sit, eat, sleep on what's clean. Does that make sense? So we have this, we, we look at it. It's funny how they say, oh, they're very different. No, they're very much the same. Except for that one, one thing that kind of went without being said, and that is the floors are, are, are dirty. So it's deeper than just, hey, floors are dirty. It explains why we use chairs and tables. And when did we learn it? Well, we learned it really probably by age five. So Stella moved at nine. She is on the inside. Her original worldview is 100% Hong Kong. Whatever subcultures win and all of that, but that's the one. Because we get it as children. It's, uh, it's unspoken, but we learned it. Oh, wait, it's often irrational, too. Because we, at age five, we're not rational. So we haven't learned the reason yet. So we inherit all that stuff early. Now, where did we learn it? Okay. Well, we learned it as kids. Where did I learn that floors were dirty? Right <laughs> so, mom gave me you know, a piece of hard candy because she was a good mom. So, I'm a little kid. I'm trying to eat this piece of hard candy. I'm just having a great time. Well, what's going to happen? There it goes. It got loose. 
Okay. What am I going to do as a four-year-old kid? I'm going to rescue that. <laughs> and what's my mom going to say? What is it? It's thirty. Okay. She doesn't know the five seconds. Yeah. Let's <laughs> see. What's really fun about the five-second rule is it proves the rule. Yeah. Exceptions prove the rule. So in class, I'll when I'm teaching this to my students, I'll get up and I'll stand up on the table that they're on. Of course, first thing they do is say, "Look back now." Of course, on Instagram. Of course, they know I'm a crazy anthropology person, but they think, oh, he's really crazy now. But once I step down, the student will put rest his notes up like this. Once I move down, he'll go before he puts the book back down. Did that mean anything? (laughs) Symbolically, it did. Symbolically, it did. <laughs> so, uh, let me give you another example. I was teaching the Bible in Indonesia okay, on an island, and I'd given an exam, and part of the exam was multiple choice. So I'm handing back the exam, and I hand back the exam to this little girl. Who was named Stella? Uh, and I noticed she had not uh, answered the, one of the questions, just left it blank. I said, Stella, you didn't answer question number three. She said, I didn't know the answer. I said, well, you should have guessed. She looked at me horrified. And she said, what if I guessed right? It would have been the answer when I didn't, and that would be lying. Well, I started to... And then I realized, wait a minute, I'm about to argue her to a lower standard. (laughs) (laughs) My my American value of pragmatism had run right over the top of my Christian value of honesty without me even noticing. Now, my students in America hate it when I tell them that story (laughs) because they want to keep guessing. But they also know you Christians should be honest. So they're very conflicted. Uh, but all of that happened without me noticing. My, my mom was not trying to teach me unchristian values, which would help me be practical. Cleanliness is next to Godliness. Okay, some of you knew that, some of you didn't. Okay, but those of you that knew that, I knew where you grew up, okay, where your worldview is. Who taught you that? I don't know, somebody knows. <laughs> is cleanliness actually next to godliness? What's the connection between cleanliness and godliness? Well, here's what's up. The answer is actually none. Okay. But those of us who grew up, at least in Texas, we it's hard for us to say none. Not a lot. <laughs> in fact, uh, some of you are trying to figure out desperately some Bible verse that's going to rescue cleanliness. <laughs> oh, wait, wait, wait. I got it. Our bodies are a temple of the Holy Spirit, okay? And surely God would want his temple to be well scrubbed. And even though he invented dirt, created dirt, then, but somehow we're going to rescue this. Even though it's a neutral value, okay? Cleanliness is whatever it is. Uh, by the way, they didn't mean soap in Jesus' day. It came later. Uh, but uh, the next one, God helps those who help themselves. Okay. That is not only neutral, that's anti biblical. Self reliance is actually a biblical vice, it's an American virtue, but a biblical vice. Uh, but it's part of my worldview. I don't know about you guys. So I like to use this illustration for a worldview. How much of the iceberg can you usually see? Just a little bit. So it is with worldview. Most of my worldview is lurking below the surface, out of sight. So how does it show up? Well, when I see that dirty person on the street, I subconsciously make decisions about them. Certainly, it could not have been a deep. I learned that, by the way, in uh, Leaf Huts in Kapua, okay, where I'm squatting there around a the fire, 
with people who are, these guys are just wearing gourds and feathers in their hair and a bun in their nose. But they were deacons, okay? And by the way, once the meeting started, it was just like any other deacons meeting you <laughs> Okay. But in your worldview, there are things above the surface and below the surface and deep below the surface. Here are some things, for instance, that are above the surface. These are some common things, mores, race, ethnicity, language, okay? These are aspects of our worldview that are, are seeable, okay? They're easily seen, they're noticeable. When you travel abroad, these are usually the things you notice, and they're often funny. When you come back and tell funny stories, they're often about these things. You know, in Indonesia, driving is a contact sport. And so, um, you know, it's just, it just creates some of that fun uh, stuff that happens. But, and we'll look briefly at some of these, like uh, mores. That's a good dog. You see, that's a good dog. Um, not mores or s'mores. Mores, mores or cultural values. And here's here's a cultural value. That's a good. I mean, when I went through Google, I mean, is that not a great picture? Okay, that's a good dog. All right. So, mores. That's a good dog. What does it mean to say that's a good dog in America? Um, well, it means you know. He fetches the ball, or he doesn't chew my slippers, or he acts like he's happy I came home, or, you know, all those kinds of things. We had a dog that my wife loved who would chew holes in the wall. <laughs> I said, that's not a good, that's a bad dog. <laughs> no, that's a bad dog. He chews holes in the wall. Okay, so, um... <laughs> My uh, my friend, that's a good dog. What does it mean to my friend Mike? So that's a good dog. Okay, so Mike says that's a good dog. What does it mean when Mike, my Australian friend, says that's a good dog? Well, mm. it may mean that he herds sheep well. Okay. Now, in Texas, they'll drive around with their dog in the back of the pickup, not properly leashed like they're supposed to be called in California. Because their attitude is, any dog dumb enough to fall out of <laughs> But if this dog, you park, that dog will stay in the back of the pickup truck. You go in, you go eat lunch or whatever, you come back, that dog is happy to see you. He stayed in the back of the pickup truck. That's a good dog in Texas. All right, so in Australia, that'd be a good dog. Now, in Indonesia, what's a good dog? That's a good dog. Okay. What does my friend Yogurt mean when he says, good dog? <laughs> By the way, uh, my wife can put on a good So there you go. All right. We, we invested. All right. So, mores, okay, language, we'll talk about in a minute. Race, ethnicity, okay. Um, this is one of those obvious mores that you can see in a culture. Paul wrote to the uh, Galatians, you foolish Galatians. Now, that didn't offend you. By the way, racial slurs almost never translate. So, um, uh, I forgot which one of our ladies said that they came from an area and they had a term that they used for it. And she started to get whatever it was, but it wouldn't have translated. And it probably wouldn't have offended uh, most of us in the room. They called, they would call me a bule in Indonesia, which means a white skin. Uh, but, it didn't really bother me uh, because it didn't really translate that. Much. It would bother my Indonesian friends. And, people. and you may say, oh, I don't think Paul really meant um, that in an offensive way. Well, you can read in my book. He, he meant, it would translate like, you stupid hillbillies. <laughs> and, uh, and he intended to offend them because what they were doing just made them mad as a hornet. Uh, but here, we'll pick a different one, one that you'll like a little bit. Miriam and Aaron began to talk against Moses because of his Cushite wife, because he had married a Cushite. Now, it seems to me their complaint was she was a Cushite, okay? Because they said, we don't like your Cushite wife because she's Cushite. Okay. Um, <laughs> just, just so you kind of clarify there. All right. This is uh, Prince Akinadad uh, of Kush. Okay. Um, Kushites were uh, African. Okay. This is a popular novel that came out a little while ago about Moses' second wife, Zipporah. She's a Kushite. And Miriam and Aaron are mad because she has married a, he has married a Kushite. Okay. Um, now, their complaint is probably, it is racial. 
So it probably is racist. But you probably read it in a different racist way than they mean. And this is where my culture can cause me to misread. Um, we think maybe your thought is, oh, Miriam and Aaron are complaining because he's married to Cushite, and maybe that's like marrying down. Well, their complaint is actually that Moses is marrying up. He's getting up at you. They said, well, has God only spoken to Moses? Who does he think he is? He's too big to marry a Hebrew now? Cushites were admired in the age. Highly And so they complain that Moses has married this Cushite. So, Daniel the Lord burns against them. Um, and when he has, he's, he does not like their racist attitude. And so how does God punish Mary? <laughs> uh, all right. So we look at, oops, let me back up. We're going to look at language for a minute. This is a great uh, passage. Um, Ephesians 2. Uh, in whom you also are being built up together. You know, in English has one word you for both you singular and you plural, which is actually even tolerable. These won't work in real life. So almost every area of the U.S. has a way of saying you plural. This, this, and by the way, we make fun of the way everyone else in America does it, if they don't do it the way we do. Uh, but, so it is you, and uh, Greek has a way of doing it. So, in, in whom you plural are being built together into a dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. So, um, what God has built as a dwelling place for the Holy Spirit is all of them. So all of us together make a well. Oh, it's the same thing with temple. You know, do you not know that you are a temple of the Holy Spirit? You plural. Now, as an American individualist, I read you as individual. So in this room, there are 40 little temples of the Holy Spirit. No, there's one. All of us together form a dwelling place for the Holy Spirit. Peter says it the same way in 1 Peter 2.5. Uh, you are living stones being built up together into a spiritual house. So God has built us plural to be a dwelling place for the Holy Spirit. But this is where my worldview starts slanting it together. Right and say it this way. I cannot worship God alone. I can adore God. But worship takes a community. So pastors, when you're trying to figure out why somebody says, why can't I worship God other than the God words? Because worship takes a communion. There's some way in which the Holy Spirit indwells believers as a group, in which he does it as an individual. We do this. Jesus says in Matthew 18, 20, where two or three of you have gathered together, where two or three of you have gathered together in my name, I am there in your midst. Here's the problem as an American individual. He was already there. If I'm there by myself, Jesus was already there. And yet Jesus says, where two or more of you are gathered together, I'm in your midst. So there is, at, at, at the very least you have to say, well, there's some way in which he's with us as a group that is richer and fuller than he is in vision. See, as an individual, I still have to rescue the individual. <coughs> Because, uh, you know, our song said, me and Jesus, we've got our own thing going. Some of you all want to remember that. So. All right. So let's do it. Let's do something different. Uh, Revelation 5, this is a great passage. Oh, wait, I generally stay out of the book of Revelation 5. It's very confusing. But I feel okay with this um, I saw on the right hand of him who sat on the throne a book, meaning a scroll, I believe, um, written inside and on the, inside and on the back, meaning it's completely Sealed up with seven seals. So here's a uh, scroll with seven seals. Um, so what does that mean to have seven seals? Well, uh, usually what we do is we go. <laughs> and then we start coming up with explanations. Because, why? Because John doesn't tell us what it meant to have seven seals. Okay. Why? Because it went without being said. Everybody knew what that meant. Well, we don't know what that means, so we fill in the gap with our own. So we say it means sealed really well. <laughs> no, no, no. See, John was seven, so seven is spiritual. Okay? So it meant like 
spiritual seal. Or ace, John uses seven for the Holy Spirit, being sealed by the Holy Spirit. There you go. All right. Um, the problem with that is, um, when we get to the next verse, who's worried to open the book and break its seal? We have no idea why that would be an issue. Because we didn't understand why what he meant to begin with. So why does I have to be worthy to open it? Um, what we didn't know um, was that when he said a scroll sealed with seven seals, everybody listening would have said, oh, it's a will. As in last will and testament. Oh, it's a will. Um, because wills were sealed with seven seals. So that's the part that went without being said that we didn't all know. Say, so how were they sealed with seven seals? Well, actually, if you were a wealthy woman, you filed your will down at the courthouse. And everybody else didn't do that. It's too expensive. Instead, you sealed it with seven seals. So you had seven people present. You had the executor of the will and the heir and five witnesses. And so the guy would write out the will. Usually he'd dictate out the will. The secretary would write it all out, read it. Everybody heard it. They would seal it up. And each person would tie a string around it and put his seal. So the executor did, the heir did, and the five witnesses. So that when the person died, then when it's time to execute the will, you wanted to make sure it hadn't been doctored or changed or altered. And so they would all come, and the first person would look, the executor would look and say, that's my seal. He would then break it and open it. The heir would, and the five witnesses would. And that was their way of validating that the will was legal and binding and valid. Good. So, the only people who were worthy were the people that had made the seal. All right. So, um, he says, I looked around heaven and earth, and there was no one able to open the book. Means the executor was not there, the heir was not there, and the five witnesses were not there. And John began to weep. Obviously, in the book of Revelation, this rule is not a re- This is like the will or who's going to inherit the cosmos. And so John is weeping, and I don't blame him. It's very sad. So then, one of the elders said to me, oh, stop crying. <laughs> the lion has overcome. He's worthy. Now, y'all know that's Jesus, right? I don't want to spoil the book of Revelation. <laughs> but i gotta, I got to ruin that part for you, just for it to make sense. So, he says... The uh, the lot Jesus is able to open. Now, what's the point he wants us to get out of that? Um, which seal does Jesus break? All of them. All of them. So, it's not only is he the heir, he's the executor of it, and he was the only one around when the will was made. So, none of the heavenly creatures were around when this will was made. That's the before the foundations of the earth kind of stuff. So you Calvinists, okay, this is Calvin right here, okay, that God predestined everything, who's going to inherit before creation began? Because there were no other witnesses. He's the only one. God's word, that's good stuff. I don't, you know, I don't know what else you do with the book of Revelation after that, but this is good stuff. <laughs> but it didn't make any sense if you didn't know what everybody knew. Okay. Why didn't John say, hey, that's a will? Because it's like, duh. Everybody knows that. He told you. It had seven seals. We're, we're, we're the ones who are a little fuzzy on that whole seven seal thing. So the danger is not only that there was a piece missing. By the way, stories always have pieces missing. You skip the parts that everybody knows. Um, you know, when Jesus says, uh, I don't give peace like the world does. <laughs> They knew who he was talking about. Because okay. Caesar's picture was on painted on the sides of buildings. And underneath it, it said, Peace and safety. Smiley Caesar. Okay. <laughs> peace and safety. What word? Safety is salvation. So Caesar is promising peace and salvation. Okay. So when Jesus says, I don't give peace like the world does, he didn't have to spell out who, who he meant. Um, so uh, the danger is not just that we're meant, there's a peace missing, the danger is that we fill it in with our peace whatever our particular culture is. Um, whether that's Texas or Hong Kong or someone was from Omaha. I don't even know what's in Omaha. 
looking for some cows. Lots of 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 cows. Okay. We all have a culture, and it will fill in those gaps too. Okay. So he wants to see these three things. I got to catch up with my notes here. All right. Um, all right. Efficiency. We're moving further down in the iceberg. These are things that we don't talk about. Why don't we talk about them? Well, because everybody knows. In an American worldview, in largely in the Western world, one of our values is efficiency. Uh, we don't talk about it, but it's like it's what's called a primary good for you ethicist folks. Um, meaning you don't have to justify it, it's it's self-evidently good. So somebody could say, hey, we could we could alter this and be more efficient. Well, you don't then have to argue why you should do that. You just you just say, well, there you go. <laughs> Done. So, I, I learned this. I was trying to buy some books in Indonesia. So I had my friend, uh, go to another bookstore. And uh, I think, oh, this book looks good, so I'll pick it up. And this Indonesian walks up next to me and takes it from me and puts it in, her, in a basket. And I thought, I guess she wanted it more than I did. <laughs> so, I walk along a little further and I pick up a Another one, oh, this looks good. And she takes a permit and goes, wait, she works here. Okay? So she's going to follow me around with a basket carrying the books that I'm going to, I think, this is pretty nice. Okay, if you're in the Walmart, you're desperate, or worse, um, Home Depot. You're desperate to find somebody. What if you wait and somebody would just walk around with you everywhere? So anyway, so I pick up the, the four books or so I wanted to buy. And now I'm looking like, I don't know what to do. So she motions me over. We go up to a register, and the person writes down in triplicate um, the books that I have and uh, and then tears off, keeps one of the sheets, takes the books, and then the person escorts me over to another register. So I go over to that register, they stamp it, and, uh, and I pay. And then I get my stamped receipt, and I go over to another register, okay, or the person gives, takes it, gives me my books, which have now been gift wrapped, which felt like Christmas, but I hadn't seen them in a while. <laughs> and so, there, so then off I, um, I get on in the car with with Gilbert, and I'm counting up four, four people, and I said, you know, I know how that could be done with just one. <laughs> And I explained it to him, and I cut off. I said, "That's what I would do." And they were just stare out the window for a few minutes. Um, and then he said, "Cause you know I'm a dumb foreigner." He said, "So, so you would put three people out of the job?" Um, I thought I had suggested an improvement for Indonesia. And he was wondering how we appreciate it and so insensitive. Um, But it was more efficient. <laughs> <laughs> what I learned in Indonesia is saying something that's more efficient is like saying we could paint it green, for sure, or we could paint it blue, it's neutral. Some of you work cross culture and you point out, hey, this would be more efficient. And you wonder, why isn't everybody jumping on board here? Okay? Because you just pointed out you could paint it a certain color. And you're thinking, well, yeah, we could, but we could paint it some other. Or at worst, it could be a negative color. Um, Individualism. Um, I was preaching in the village up in Borneo, and uh, after uh, I finished, we're sitting around the living room while they're starting to cook, and uh, and they're looking like they want to ask me something. I said, "What is it?" And they said, "Well, can that the pastor? Um, we have a we have a difficult church issue, and we're not sure what to do." I said, "Well, what is it?" They said, "Well, we have this." young couple who committed a grievous sin in their home village. So much so they had to move to our village. That was about 10 years ago. They've been living wonderful, godly lives ever since. But they want to join our church. I'm just not sure. If... I said, what they do? I said, oh, very, very serious. I said, and I'm thinking, you know, whatever I decide is going to be it. So, I really need to know more information. I said, so what what you know what exactly did, did they do? They don't want to air dirty laundry in front of a foreign but finally said, okay. They married on the run, which is what in America we call the local. I 
And I said, so what's in? They looked at me and they said, have you never read it? I thought, gee, I did a PhD on the library. <laughs> 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 I did. Um, I don't remember any verses about the old man. Uh, and I said, what do you mean? They said, Paul says, children obey your parents. He said, no, we know kids don't always obey their parents. But in the most important decision that they'll ever make, you think they should obey their parents. And I realized, wow, they were reading a different Paul than I did. Because my worldview had taught me that that verse had an expiration date. That verse applied to you were 18. But surely, and now when I mention this to my young students, they're all thinking about getting married. Um, they're desperately scrambling in their heads for some verse they can use to counter that. And of course, they can't come up with one. So what they'll say is, well, surely God does not want me to whatever. And I said, you mean like not actually obey that verse. The problem is, my American individualism absolutely trumps because we know Paul was writing Ephesians to a bunch of middle school kids. So when he said children, he was referring to them, not the people he was actually writing to. So, uh, who were uh, children? Uh, we sure would like to find some my kids at least would like to find some verse that will help them ignore Paul um, I'm going to get us out of time uh, let me hurt your feelings <laughs> Jeremiah 29 11 you know, which has to be printed on every graduating kid <laughs> so, um, if a kid graduates from high school he's a Christian kid if he doesn't have at least five things with that imprinted on them then their parents have failed <laughs> um, what verse am I referring to out of Jeremiah 29 there's a lot of there I know the plans I have for you guess what that you is God says I have a plan for you is Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Now, there's about 30,000 <coughs> Jews at that point who wanted to differ over that because about 40,000 of them were killed and about 40,000 were hauled away into slavery. But God planned. We, we know the story. So we're okay. We're good. Because they come back out of exile. Remember that? So, good. All right. It was 70 years later. Okay. doesn't help my college freshman which was, you know what, God has a plan and perhaps in as early as 70 years <laughs> 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 I'm convinced that verse applies individually um, and it won't even matter how many bad things happen to you, we'll run back to that uh, verse because my individualism will, you know there are a lot of great verses in Jeremiah 29 but that's the one we love uh, and by the way, God does have a plan for his people. Plans to prosper. Um, all right. Last thing, honor shame. I'm going to do this really briefly. Uh, I'm changing my mind about honor shame. I'm pushing it further down the iceberg because it's just huge. Uh, and I'm going to... Uh, Rich and I are writing a book, and we're going to take a different view on honor shame than the other two guys who write on this topic. They're friends of mine, and they're wonderful guys, and they're wrong. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, we think honor shame. <coughs> I've told them that. So. Um, and we're going to tell them that in October when we do a conference together. Um, we think honor and shame are tools that collectivist cultures use to maintain and enforce their values. Um, <coughs> visualist cultures will use guilt, for instance. Okay. And any of you who have a mother, okay, 
and you grew up in an individualist culture, you don't need me to tell you how your mom will use guilt to enforce and reinforce a cultural value. Um, but in uh, collectivist cultures, they use honor and shame. And shame is actually a positive thing, even though we don't usually think of it that way. It is knowing the difference between right and wrong. And English used to understand this, but we boogered up the language of the fears. Um, there used to be a phrase, shameless, meaning you didn't have any shame. You were shameless if you, if you acted in a way that suggested you didn't know the difference between right and wrong. And they would say, have you no shame? Will you know the difference between right and wrong? And so shame would tell you, oh, you have crossed the boundary. It becomes a very negative culture when it doesn't have grace. Do you like the way I woke before you in there, Bill? Okay. Uh, shame becomes negative when it doesn't have grace, when it doesn't offer a way back. Christian, in Christian culture, shame always has a way back. It cautions people, don't cross that line, don't cross that line. But then if you're shameless, as we all are at times, we'll cross the line and then grace offers us a way back. Well, that's for another day. We're not going to get too much into that. Last thing, here we go. After our break, um, we're going to come back and we're going to talk about a few more. But you notice we're going to spend a lot more time on these last few than we did on the first ones. These are way down deep in our world. Way down deep. In fact, so far down, we're usually not uh, aware. But they absolutely shape who we are, shape our worldview. They, um, um, they, I think they cause misunderstandings, hurt feelings, damaged relationships, because we're acting based on that value or that assumption. Someone from another culture doesn't share that. They don't understand why we're doing what we're doing. Um, for instance, that one Rules versus relationship. Boy, does that shift a lot of difficult issues. So we'll talk about that. But you guys are desperate for some coffee. There's some muffins out there calling your name. Try not to be gone too long. Come back because we have to finish this up and then have lunch. All right. Thanks.